Welcome to the Five Phenomenon Podcast. I am your host, Shane Hazen, and with me two weeks in a row, <laughs> Ted Haycraft. Yeah, and um, it's interesting, too, because uh, I, I remember when we got, we were finished with, uh, we shot the, uh, we recorded the intro last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forgot that I had, I wanted to mention Richard Rush, because I oh, was yeah, watching yeah. Getting we- Straight. And, you know, and he had just passed away, which, uh, which, which started, the, which wasn't the impetus for doing this episode, and, which and, this episode, which it's great. Intro. And, and Monty Hellman, Pat, and then we have Monty Hellman passing away. So these two interesting, fascinating directors and, and careers. And I think, uh, uh, Shane, I mean, you know, we're what generation two, a couple of generations apart, or whatever. Mm-hmm. but, uh, you started getting into films the, these two guys, uh, you quickly, you know, you, you start reading it up on like uh, Mavericks and cult. Uh, I felt good. The, the term I'm going to use in the sh- in the show notes. I'm glad I saw Kim Morgan use a, a very. She said directors, directors. I was thinking filmmakers, filmmaker. Yeah, both yeah, of these, right. and it, it's yeah. It it, it 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 was it was a notable passing. We are discussing this week. Uh, Tulane Blacktop and Getting Straight, which Tulane Blacktop is probably Monty Hellman's most best known movie, but Getting Straight is not necessarily Richard Rush's best right. known movie. I think, I think, yeah, I think Stunton would probably uh, would be Richard this Rush. This is now. my choice, though. Just because, oh no, 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 because yeah. I, I just recently finally got around to watching it. What? Oh, because Quentin Tarantino had. Uh, you just recently got around to watching it. Getting how, Straight. How, how recent? Well, just a, f- a few weeks ago, remember? I, I, I think like I, I, it was like several days before the last time when we recorded the episode. Wow! It's, it was just re- really recent. I, I had to buy a copy off of eBay. Uh, the uh, but uh, well, before before we get into this, okay. let's do our basic. Would, what what did you watch this week? Anything oh, cool? What did I uh, What did I watch this week? I, well, I was watching a lot of. Uh, gosh, I wish I brought my journal now. You're you're a, you're a catch. What have I? What did well, I? I've never asked you this question <laughs> before. You're caught the words. I'll go uh, into no, my. No, no, wait, 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 you want you want a second? I can go into mine. Oh yeah, go ahead. I I did. I watched a few things this week. I'm catching up. You and I are both on this pace of like getting through more Mike Nichols after Mark Harris's. And I watched uh, Cardinal Knowledge. Rewatched Cardinal Knowledge. I noticed and, you did that. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I was, I saw it years ago, and and I had a weird memory of Anne margaret being the pathos of that movie and this time especially this week since when we're going to talk getting getting straight and candace bergman bergen's going to come up she is clearly the heart of that movie and and well there was just so much to um yeah and it's it's so fa- you know I, of course the, to me that one of the most fascinating it, things is jules pfeiffer yeah, yeah. Uh, Jules, Pfeiffer, Jules Pfeiffer coming up in the Mark Harris book is interesting, but you and I we come from a, from a little bit from a comic book side too. Yeah, yeah. We have really inside uh, knowledge I, of his comic I, book his, uh, background. My feeling when you're watching the movie is I think some of the aging doesn't work, especially with Art Garfunkel. But if you discount that, I mean, it's it. I remember this feeling when I finally saw Closer too. Uh, it's uh, carnal knowledge is just as incisive today as it is dead it's it cuts to the fucking bone and and also anytime i this will come up a little bit and getting straight uh anytime i see late 60s 70s early drinking and especially someone with the high cl- high class in new york drinking all i think is Mad Men anymore and i think they probably drank a lot more at the time <laughs> um and you also did you re- i just saw, noticed you rewatched uh, citizen kane didn't you that what was, was that was actually uh, brought on my my stepmom watched Mank and my dad apparently has never seen Citizen Kane. My stepmom and Citizen Kane's one of those movies. I did a list a few years ago, of how, like an estimate of the movies I've seen the most in my life, and it would be like Star Wars or it'd be two thousand one Star Wars or Empire Strikes Back, Wrath of Khan and Citizen Kane, and then Police Academy 3 and 4, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1 and 2. But anyway, those are the movies I've seen more than 50 or 100 times, and I probably haven't seen Citizen Kane in a few years. But because Mank came out, my stepmom wanted to rewatch uh, Citizen Kane, and my dad's never seen it. And it's funny, because as they left, I told my stepmom, hey, we did an episode on Raising Kane, and I let her borrow the Citizen Kane book. So she's going to read it in all its... Gl- the, the glory of that essay and all its bad research that went into Mank. <laughs> But um, the one thing, interesting thing I wanted to talk about this week, uh, semi-movie related, and one of my big recommendations of the week is, did you see Richard Brody posting this article about after 
He had seen Paul Schrader talking on Facebook. He did a real mini interview. Paul Schrader has been very incisive, I think, in the pandemic on talking about what he foresees in the future. Have you? Did you see this article? I guess I didn't. You know, uh, uh, Paul's been posting a lot lately. In fact, he, he's actually been throwing things out for us to respond to. Uh, like uh, he he was like ask he asked a question like well, if this means this, well, what else do you see? And, and he's encouraging uh, people to uh, uh, give responses. So it's it's interesting. Uh, One see. of these posts apparently got Richard Brody to talk. And the the way I look at it is, uh, you know, Paul Schrader. Weirdly, I feel like the reason I'm responding to so much of his insights and analysis on this is we're kind of in the same boat because he's an elder statesman for independent film and artistic film. And if he's having struggles with this, how does someone who's just a craftsman who hasn't edited a movie in a few years who's looking for work, how the fuck am I supposed to do it? But one interest, the, the quote I wanted to pull out, he was talking about... Um, the difference with what, what where streaming is going and how everyone wants to watch long form streaming in all formats and what's going to happen to the two hour format. The two hour format, which was so ideally suited to theatrical, we've now trained young people for 15 months not to see that as a primary way to have audio visual entertainment. Now, how they come back or if they come back, they're certainly not going to come back in the way they once were. I see four venues for theatrical and one is extreme spectacle, which is like 40 hour or like that Van Gogh immersive experience that's coming. Uh, I guess that's a New York thing. Then you, that you have to go out of the house for. That's a reason to go out of the house. Children's movies, of course, because you want to see your kids laugh with other kids. That's really for parents more than for the kids. And then you have date night movies, which is horror and a certain kind of teen comedy. And there'll still be a place for that. And then you have what we now call club cinema, which is where you have membership. And anyway, he basically describes for the rest of the article, they talk about the artistic movie and what it means for the two hour format and the future of things like Oscar movies or to it. That's interesting because I, I, I had a discussion with Mick Steeler. Really? Uh, uh, back I ran into him when we saw uh, news of the, from the world or the Tom Hanks film. Mm-hmm. And uh, we talked about a very, about a subscription club and about, so, you know, you know, again, uh, the, you know, cause they, they know they sold off the uh, theater. They were going to try to make a art house out of, uh, but they're still not, it's still going to drive by it all the time tier. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, they got a lot of screens and, and mixed with concern about getting people to come out and see movies. And so that very well, we may see that happen here, you know, uh, well, locally or around the world, you know, well, the trick about Paul Schrader getting is he's so insightful. He's so incisive on his analysis, but he's so fatalistic and oppressive about everything too. <laughs> You have yeah. to you have to keep both things in, in mind when trying to figure out how much accurate he might be in the future. Yeah, but no, I, I, in fact, that's interesting. You said Brody too, because I, I I think I I put on my cinema chat Facebook page a quote from Brody on the passing of one of Helmut or Rush. I can't remember what it was, but it was very insightful. Did you want to talk your movies, or is that our transition? I, I we might we might our transition because I can't. I mean, I've, I've watched them every night this last week since we recorded the last one, and I can't. The life of me, I, I I watched some things on Neil Young and Bob Dylan, but they were not really movies. Okay, uh, but I can't. But I, well, I think what happened was it was interesting. I watched Too Late Blacktop uh-huh. before you contacted me about maybe doing a podcast on it. Huh. So I was on a kind of on a Hellman roll, and I finished off with a shooting ride, the World One and Cockfighter. So uh, I I almost got around to Cockfighter. I watched the shooting, which uh, Letterbox told me I've seen before. I I I don't typically do this, but I think I lied to myself and gave myself the extra credit. I did. I don't think I've ever seen the shooting before. We th- we when I told you that you you thought that one of Hellman's biggest fans is uh, Richard Linklater, and he very frequently programs movie series through uh, the Austin Film Society in my period living there. So I might have seen it. <laughs> uh, Linklater was definitely my pathway to seeing Too Late Blacktop. Do you want to start with Too Late Blacktop first or Getting Straight? Which one? Uh, it's whatever you feel like. like I have first. the most notes on Getting Straight. Really? But, mm-hmm. but let, let's go with Too Late. Let's go. Uh, let's do Too Late Blacktop okay, sure. first. Just because Too Late Blacktop, I first saw, I think, when Criterion put it out. That was how late I got to it. And it's a movie that this is, th- I watched it last night. It's only my second viewing. It's a movie I've always, it's always impressed me. It's bewildered the hell out of me. Um, it always seems like um, it's captivated me, but it always seems like um, obviously very existential, but it's kind of got this uh, hypnotic ennui to it, you know, like, I don't, I think, I think also what's, what's, uh, you, what do you go, what do you get to a, 
second or third showing movie because I think it's very. I got, I had a very uh, engaging response. I, I got, it. I was engaged the second. Very movie. engaged. Uh, but you know, I think the first time I think I saw it uh, was on television. Tulane Blacktop. I on think television. I think it was like a universal late night package or something. Because I think I remember, I, I the, you know the ending. It's a very distinctive ending, and I thought yeah, I which had, supposedly had been cut off for years. The, are you talking about the ending ending or the uh, ending of the uh, how the film ends? You know, and I think well because you know that was cut off from the versions for a while. Oh, uh, the TV version. See, I, I, I don't, I don't even know if it's it. a TV version. It yeah. was just whenever they showed release prints. Apparently, right. they cut so, in some theatrical. Uh, I just remember. It's always had this, uh, it, uh, this you know, this aura of you know, uh, cultness around it forever. And of course, I think the hilarious thing is Esquire. You know, the whole Esquire thing they, where they printed uh, Rudy Wurlitz cover whole feature, screenplay, put the whole screenplay. So this, this is the going to be the film of the year, and then you know, it flatlined terribly. Well, well Hellman acted like they they just completely they released it on the Fourth of July weekend and backed out on him, like because yeah. the, half the Universal Brass he, he really has it in for Lou Wasserman on this. It sounds like, but for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, it's a really fascinating film. It's basically it's one of those films where the, the characters don't have their own names. It, it's the driver, driver, the mechanic, mechanic, and GTO, GTO, and the and the girl. I think it's just the girl. She's just called the girl. I think yeah. Oh. Uh, I think. It, uh, and uh, you got you basically have uh, War Notes, the great great War Notes as GTO, and he's gonna race against this uh, J- James Taylor, and Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys, mm-hmm. uh, and they're like expert car nuts. They're this little fifty five Chevy they've got got souped up, and uh, it's <laughs> it's it's. Yeah, it's a road picture, but you know it's, it's a road picture with not a road. lot of road picture with not a lot of incident. Yes, uh, yeah. Well, or the most the most distinctive thing about this movie, and this is a vague spoiler, but it's a race movie where no one's interested in racing or winning. Yeah, you know, it's it's it, Monty uh, Hellman. The quote I, I finally heard him say, just we were going through some of the Criterion features. Monty Hellman just flat out said they're racing with themselves to be better people, which I didn't pick up on but i get the sense that like they're not exactly racing with each other um uh, yeah and i and i, and I uh I, I there's something about i think if you love film the way like or crazy or obsessive like shane and i are in history and 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 the context of the history and the industry and the people and the artistry this one really is an amazing film in some ways it, it really is uh the almost in some ways an essential film and to see and to think about and to really contemplate. And I love how the beginning, I think it starts out. It makes me think I'm more, I'm, I'm back and watching, um, uh, James Dean. Uh, what's the one where he's racing? Uh, it's a uh, rebel without a cause. Yeah. Yeah. And then the title credits are notice, so simple. They're so right with the, uh, the yellow line going up. I'm thinking we're watching a uh, film going through projector. It, oh. it really, if you, uh, and, that, and, that, and that, of course, foreshadows how that film's going to end in a way. Yeah, yeah, very much yeah. so. Very much so. If you watch, take, next time you watch that, because even almost the sound he's got, the, 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 the sound of the road almost sounds like going through a projector in a way. It's very, very interesting. What, is it masculine and feminine, the one Godard puts the sound of the projector into the movie? The projector. I, yeah, I haven't seen that one. So Because uh, it's in Ichimama Tambian, they do the same thing, too, yeah. whenever the narration comes up. But um getting into some technical stuff one thing i found like one basic it's just it's a gorgeous gorgeous widescreen movie it's shot in technoscope which uh technoscope ted you would love just because all the leone westerns were shot in it and it's 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 really especially if you get the blu-ray like it's a beautifully grainy thing it's a two-per format so basically what it is is they're they're not using the full frame they're using half the frame and American Graffiti is one of the other movies I love that looks like it. American Graffiti always strikes me as the sister movie. Or well, yes, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm watching this this time and I'm like, I feel like I'm in the same universe. I feel like uh, uh, Billy and Captain America from Easy Rider, they're, they're, they're driving around going down the New Orleans mm. as, as these guys are going east. And then over in, in Modesta or wherever uh, American Graffiti takes place. Uh, American Graffiti has more of a, like, well, it's on the same time period too. Uh, uh, it just has a little bit more of a suburban feel to it. Oh yeah, like, yeah. No, no, yeah, yeah. But yeah. but at the same time, the the, the craziest overlap. Well, first off, you 
Tulane Blacktop has some amazingly gorgeous, very spare night photography, which that has in, in common with American Graffiti. American Graffiti had a Haskell Wexler design this basic system of putting a light in a car and when the stocks couldn't get enough stuff at night, but they look, and they were both shot in technoscope, so they look very similar in that regard, but I don't know, just, just dr obviously drag races. <laughs> oh, oh, the, the one point I was going to break is the, the common thread between them is Gary Kurtz, George Lucas's producer, worked on both. Right, and also, don't you think, I thought, also thought it was funny because uh, when Tulane Blacktop was made, uh, this is right, that little tiny window where the big studios were like throwing money to uh, anybody hoping to get that easy rider money. So they actually greenlit Tulane Blacktop, Universal did. Right. When it came to do American Graffiti, they did not want to do it. Coppola had to come in and put his name on it to, in order to get that made with Universal. Yeah. That, that, so that, it's like by the time you, American Graffiti comes around, uh, which is a much more accessible, much more fun film to watch in, in, a, in a general audience sense. There's that myth making story that Lucas and Coppola like to tell of when they had a screen that like blew the roof off. Ned Tannen from Universal is just like, ah, we're going to have to cut this and put it on TV. And Coppola pulls out his checkbook. He's like, I'll buy it for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> The other funny thing about Tulane Blacktop, for such a, I mean, Richard Linklater described it as like a drive-in movie uh, filmed by a French New Wave director. <laughs> okay. Did you see that our local drive-in, the, uh, the Starlight, before the pandemic, this is one of the last movies they were going to show before the pandemic. They were yeah. going to do a double feature of this in American Graffiti. I, yeah, I know. And I, and we, and I meant, I go, I should go, I should go there. I well, should be there I, I guess it, it's mainly a car. They're doing souped up car, old, older cars. Mainly that was the appeal. Yeah, I'd be curious if people that go to the Frog Follies or that real car nuts would like this film or not. Uh uh, I got a feeling that we're underestimating them, not for much, so much of their uh, existential bona fides, yeah. but like the, just the cars. Like, yeah, I know, no, no, no. Early they, 70s car It movie. would be really curious to see if they really go, yeah, that's cool because I like to get to see all this car talk. Because I put the, I put the uh, closed captioning on. Cause the, 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 How the, was that? Because uh, I wanted to catch all the they – were, they were throwing out all these uh, – car terms, automobile terms and stuff that I wanted to catch it all. Mm. Uh, and it, it really helped in a way. You was know? there a lot of just one word sentences though during, <laughs> during dramatic scenes? I guess. Uh, so, the, so Dennis Wilson and James Taylor, Monty Hellman's way of getting through this is they don't really have that much dialogue. And James no. Taylor's face is chiseled. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing how like Taylor is like this tall, gawky, but at the same time, he's got this really determined face when he's younger. There's a story that we're supposing when they did a screen test with him, they couldn't figure out they wanted him mustache or without mustache. So the screen test, they shot him shave the mustache. But especially later in the movie when, like, uh, he has the determined face on, it's you're, you're, you're disappointed that this is the only movie he's ever been in. Yeah, and, and again, it's funny because you, you, you hear all kinds of, if, you know, uh, growing up and getting into film and you read things and, and hear about non-actors or how, you know, they can't act or this thing. And I, I'm just like, this time around, I was really, I think both those guys uh, are good. engaging yeah. in, in a very special way. Just like, I guess, uh, like uh, Bresson gets in his non-actors over in his French films, I was you know? just going to bring up Bresson, the Bressonian yeah. approach. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the mixture, you know. And then you got Warren, you know. <laughs> just Maybe half of this works because he offsets everything so yes, much. Yes, and Warren's just... This is just a perfect war notes. Uh, uh, you just you gotta you gotta. I was thinking on the way driving going on the way over here. Warren is one of those guys that uh, it's like Gene Hackman. I just love they just uh, when I when they're in a movie, I just love it. Yeah. And uh, and he's just a perfect role. I love how he he's got this GTO. He's he's always wearing these cashmere sweaters. And he's changing them out all the time, changing where, colors every. Day. Where, yeah, where it's Taylor and, uh, and Dennis are wearing the same thing all the time. Uh, so. And he picks. He has a habit of picking up hitchhiker uh, hitchhikers, and every time he picks up a hitchhiker, he tells them a different backstory. I have. The, I wrote down the stories. You know what I was thinking of? What uh, this? I, this is. I, this is not a real connection. It was just something my brain went to. But I thought it would be neat if uh, Christopher Nolan used him as the inspiration for when they were doing the Joker, for when the Joker keeps changing oh, his stories yeah. in Dark Knight. But when the first one, he says that he's a jet pilot. Then he says he's a TV producer, which at point James Taylor says, I don't want to hear about it. Uh, then he says he's the uh, 
manager for the the two guys um and at one point um someone asked or the girl asked is this a game and he just says i don't know and then later in the movie in a scene that includes monty hellman's daughter in the back seat uh he says he's bought a house for his mom in saint petersburg and and then the last one the very funny one is the really interesting one where he says he won this yeah, I, I mean, I guess a uh, spoilerish. He won this car in a race where he used to be driving a '55 Chevy. Well, basically, yeah. The, the, I, I think uh, I, I don't think it's going to ruin it uh, for anybody who hasn't seen it and wants to watch. Because this it. isn't a plotty movie. But if he basically GTO tells he, he he the last story he says is basically the story of what Dennis and James, you know. The, yeah. So it's it's beautiful. It's a just it's so beautifully crafted the the screenplay, which is uh, Rudy Walter. We should mention, which is a very interesting guy. Uh, and well, uh, you shouldn't mention, but I need to. I mean, I know a little bit about him, and in my library in the next room over there, I have one of his novels. But I am really curious more about him. I want to know more about. Oh him. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. He's one of these guys. Uh, it's like it's it's like uh, Aaron Mac Roush of Booker Bonsai. He's like these two guys. A lot of these writers are have really interesting. He was a writer when he came on the scene. Thomas Pynchon was pushing him. He did uh, Walker for Alex Cox. He did yeah. Win for Carol Ballard. America for Robert Downey Sr. And a movie I, I've I'm, I'm, Walker's the only one of these I've seen. Little Buddha for Bertolucci. But there's and. He wrote a novel in the Nog. early 80s called Slow... F- oh, Nog is the one that Pynchon liked, but there's a movie, uh, a novel he did in around 84, I think it is, called Slow Fade that is about a director that some have said is based off Sam Peckinpah, which will go into Rudy Willitzer's, which Chris Christopherson, when we were watching this thing, said is a companion... Or no... Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Monty Hellman said is a companion piece to this. The oh. movie is near and dear to your heart. Well, yeah, and, and Pat... I mean, yeah, there's a... there's a there, Well... Yeah, because I, I, I let me think about that. I it just hit me like Pat Garrett, uh, uh, uh Billy the Kid's just kind of uh is kind of going nowhere. He kind of circles around, and, and the, the the whole the aspect of the where where are you going existentially, uh, and that's what the uh, Too Late Blacktop has got going for it. So. I mean, I, I haven't seen Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid for years. I only saw it once. I don't know. You are very distinct on which version I need to watch. I think I watched it probably in two thousand six or whatever that restoration version was. But I remember, like, I'm a big fan of Scorsese's uh, Gangs of New York, mm-hmm. and it's a movie I loved. Uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. I like this idea of like someone's chasing someone or have a revenge movie where they don't really want to have revenge and they want to be friends with the person they're supposed to be having right. revenge on. Well, yeah. I mean, and Pat goes out of his way to, to take his time, you know, and, and that, you know, you, so you have the sequence where the famous riverboat sequence and where he's just sitting on the river and, and a, <laughs> this uh, homemade barge comes down with a family on it and they're just shooting and the river and then Pat joins in on them yeah. and then they're about like, to draw on each other. And it's just, it's a, it's a sequence that you you makes you existential sequence actually, and you makes you wonder. And of course, the studio wanted to cut it out, but uh, that's broody. That's uh, well, there's uh, from what I can tell, he's making interesting movies, and that's something that like a lot of screenwriters don't have the credit to. Novels turning to screenwriters, and a lot of novels turning to screenwriters don't understand the format, so they're mad that things get cut and some such. But uh, but yeah, but getting the. Uh, uh, Warren, um, yeah, you two were mentioning all his different uh, backstories. There's a lot of great one, uh, great lines in this thing. I remember there's like, uh, uh, oh, James, I think this is from James Taylor. He goes, uh, turn the radio off. It gets in the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right when he started racing. Yeah. Uh, and, then, uh, and then there's another, I, I wrote, this is stuff I just randomly wrote. Yeah, I didn't take many notes, but uh, got to keep moving. Yeah, that's a good one. You, you know one line that really got to me early is, I think it's near dinner. Uh, Dennis Wilson's open um, or no, no, it's when the girl gets in the car and she says, are any of you the Zodiac killer? Yeah. And I immediately, I, my head, my brain, I thought Manson and Dennis Wilson being a friend of the Manson kind. I was like, you let that blind in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that's actually got to keep moving. I think that's GTO's line. Uh, you could never get, you could never go fast enough. I don't remember uh, that. Where's that? Where's that? Was, where is that at? I, I, like I said, I just wrote, I just wrote these down and then uh, I'm going to go into orbit. Is that, I don't remember that. I like, I like that. Uh, and then, of course, the, a really great one. one of the this is ones. all because of your closed caption, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it helped. Uh, uh, those satisfactions are permanent. That those that's that's GTO when he's telling one of his stories. Goes, well, supposedly no. Hellman made a big point of giving everyone their lines. They they the way they filmed this, they drove cross country. It was you know even though it was a sub million dollar uh, 
budget, they still went across country with this and he would give the actors their lines the morning before. Very few actually had the script all the way through. But I mean, for, for a movie where it seems like you're trying to hide lines, this is really literate stuff that like these lines are thrown off and they work. Yeah, and, and it's interesting you, you mentioned that they really uh, they drove uh, they were really driving the location. You see the landscape change. You, you know, really do. You, you, you're uh, you're down southwest, open and the horizon, the big sky, and then by the end of the film, it's uh, they, they, you know, foliage and trees. They and everything's closing in uh, on on them. You know. Yeah, they. I remember noting that whenever you saw the state signs, I was like, "This is." this is a second unit shot, but knowing the way they shot the movie, no, probably not. This was main unit probably shot this. Um, there was also like, a, a one of the, and I, I, I love this film too. Um, if you love, I have a, I don't know. I have this really sentimental streak about uh, old cafes on the highway and yeah, greasy spots and things that they're still there. They're still out there in the country, in America, but you know, it, it's some of it. Oh, uh, you know, the, the, when you get, you got your gas, the attendant pumped it for you. You know, you didn't pump it. Uh, you need to go to New Jersey, Ted. <laughs> and uh, so there's, but there was one of them. Uh, I, I think it's when they lose the girl when she leaves. But I think it, they had, uh, it had uh, on the on the walls, no dancing sign. I, I was, didn't see that. Yeah, dude, dude. I'm like, that's I'm like, what, what? Do people spontaneously dance with these things? I mean, it was just really kind of curious to see that sign on there uh, saying no dancing and in a, in a, in a greasy spoon. Uh, place so it's just uh, it's just a lot of uh, uh, a lot to contemplate a lot of again, engagement in this film where you think you know at first, I think the first time you, you might be exposed to it not knowing what's going on yeah it, it's like it's amateur acting it's slow it, is it is there any story here what's going on but that's it's 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 all there it, 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 you just gotta uh, look for it and and engage into it well the crazier story I was unaware of What's, it was the actress's name? Laura Bird. Laura Bird died or committed suicide just a few years ago. Yeah, after this. she was, uh, I think, with Garfunkel at the time. Oh, she wow. was, a, 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 but she only did three movies. Mm. I mean, uh, Hellman said uh, that he kind of, it, it makes sense. He cast not from past performances or footage, but he cast from stills and faces, which, going back to the Brissonian idea, I mean, it works and it works in this movie too. We should talk about. Uh, and Hellman's sense of editing. He's an editor. He's an editor. Yeah. <laughs> he, he. I mean, he also speaking of Peck and Paul. Yeah. One of his like big credits was he, besides he does a lot of uncredited stuff, but um, Killer Elite Killer for Elite. Sam Peck and Paul. Yeah, very st- interesting uh, film. Uh, but uh, the uh, if you watch uh, after watching the shooting and Ryan the Whirlwind uh, and he, uh, and some of uh, and Cockwater, but more so in the two westerns and this one. He has a really interesting sense of editing where he just, uh, you know, I, I've seen so many films where, you know, they, you, you, the, the Hollywood tends to smooth things out so you, you don't think about the cuts. So, you know, so they, they let the door, they, they, when somebody exits, you see the guy going through the door, the door shuts before they go to the next scene. Or uh, there's a cover, you know, you have a, a cover shot before you go in tight. Mm-hmm. Hellman just cuts right next. He'll cut out of one scene to another scene, and 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 not reveal what they're doing in the next scene. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think and, I noticed it more in the shooting. Though. Yeah. There's a there's a point like later in the movie with the shooting where he intercuts scenes to the point where I don't. I, I mean, it was interesting, but yeah. Uh, I mean, some of it. I think in the shooting, it, some some of it's done for that existential existential feel. Right. When Millie Perkins shows up, he looks. They they. Uh, Will Hutchkins is in a shooting and he looks up and he sees her, but Warren doesn't see her. And then Warren looks up right, and also right. uh, he, a, a buzzard goes off. So it distracts Warren's eye uh, sight. Warren looks over to the bird. We cut back and Millie Perkins is standing there. That is such a great, that, and is, then, that is so great. Right. That, that was like Kurosawa there. That is amazing. Right. And then the next cut, she's down in front of him. And we and then we don't even you know we're, we're, she's like all of a sudden like, it's there's like, a time oh. cut in that second cut though isn't yeah there? it's time but it but it's uh you don't get it, there's no transition it's like you don't see her starting to walk down or anything it's like she would she's standing there solitary on the on the mountain bang she's standing in front of him right close to him well uh one of the cool things going back real briefly to two lane blacktop you mentioned you, you touched on the ending earlier which I pointed out it was cut in the earlier versions and restored later is just film slowing down and i i mean it's such a hyped up ending 
that seeing the shooting again, or for the first time, not again, distinctly not again, for the first time, that ending where they slow stuff down at that ending. Wow. Like, cause you want to, I'm it, it, at the time you think slow motion, you think Peck and Paul is going to go into wild bunch, but really what came to mind, we're talking 30 years in advance is Wong Kar Wai and his like, like slow frame process where he was doing 12 frames a second. And, and he would, you know, ex to accentuate a moment, you'd have these like, st like you're going 12 frames a second. It's, yeah, both the shooting and Two Lane Blacktop have these very, very strange uh, scratch your head endings, uh, uh, and uh, and they both uh, are slow, the film slowing down. You hear, you, I guess you saw. I don't know did you, on your research or did you do, uh, listen to anything in the commentaries? Or anything? For some reason, the uh, uh, Hellman it really brings he brings up the Zapruder film a lot for the shooting. That ending. makes sense because the other weird thing I thought a lot about was Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, uh, and he didn't, and plus he didn't shoot it. Uh, in slow motion, he didn't uh, the frame. He didn't change the frame rate. No, 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 and that's how yeah, it works. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. He, it was uh, what do you call it? it still, sh it a, it a he wasn't it. shooting twelve frames a second. He slowed it down. Yeah, yeah. I'm repeating frames. I had this fantasy whenever I became. Uh, um, uh, uh, in demand in Hollywood and can have any movie I wanted to make. I was going to reach back to another generation and get sell certain directors. Any movie you want made, I'll make it right now. And Monty Helen was going to be one of the ones I was like yeah. reaching out to. But I really haven't seen like China China Nine Liberty Thirty Seven was the next one I was going to see. Have you ever seen that one? I think I've seen I don't know uh, portions of it or some of it on television. But it's a hard. It's a it's one of those weird. I think uh, slip of the copyrights. It's you, if you get a DVD of it. It's really crappy versions, oh. uh, and and I, and of course I'm dying to I, I really need to see it and have it in my uh, in my brain because Sam Peckinpah plays a part in the film, huh. and when they were shooting it, there's uh, I got steals. It's in my cover shot. If you go to my Facebook Cinema Chat Facebook page, Sergio Leone visits the set, and there's Sam, Sergio, and Monty all in the one same shot. Uh, it's a bit, you know when legends collide. Um, it's interesting to bring this up just because um, based on what we were talking about last week, I really pushed this idea that I, I was waiting for you to piggyback on or confirm with kind of an elder statesman version of it. But this idea that we were talking about Bud Bedecker last week and you being such a big Peck and Paul Leone guy, I was saying that Le uh, Bedecker, my discovery of him was seen like a missing link between John Ford to I said Leone, but I mean yeah. clearly it's like Peck and Paul Leone and mm -hmm. as a Western thing. And this the, um, Hellman's <laughs> Hellman's two uh, westerns, they're they're like a. I, I, I want to say like, you know, a branch off as I as I pointed out before the uh, uh, John Ford. You know he's like. A, the master West, you know, there's a, it, 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 apparently it, it didn't really happen or, or it did, but he, you know, they were at a director's guild meeting and John Ford stood up and goes, uh, I, I, I direct Westerns, you know? Oh, I thought you were going to say John Ford's like, I got Westerns. The rest of you Hawks <laughs> stop doing these. <laughs> so, you know, so you got, you know, he's like, you know, he's on this one branch, you know, uh, one giant branch, the A, a branch, the, the root, the tree doing all these great, a big budget, uh, important Westerns. Then you have another branch going down, uh, that's parallel. Uh, and it's, uh, Anthony Mann and mm -hmm. his five of Jimmy Stewart, which ends. And when, about the time it ends, it's the Randolph Scott, but Bedecker film start up the cycle. Mm -hmm. So you have this nice cycle and, it's psychological. It's playing with the the myth of the Western. It's and as we said, by the time the the Butterker Scott uh, cycle gets uh, down to almost just bare bones and the and just isol uh, isolated characters and the mythology mythology. But is it as existential yet? Uh? Right. And then we have Peck and Paul do ride the high country, which kind of is like a a, a, a bridge, a, a coda. And of course, he does Major Dundee, which is a whole that's a, that's a whole other podcast. And then after Dundee, he's uh, is the Wild Bunch. The Wild Bunch has got a different feel to me in a way because I think that the only films had come in and they interrupted the branch. And uh, I think the Wild Bunch was made. Do you? Are you do, we've never talked about this. Do you? Because uh, I just read. I forget the guy. The, the book, the Wild Bunch book, came out. But do you, you think that uh, Wild Bunch was Peck and Paw's reaction to Leone? Like, is this like a Beatles Beach Boys view? No. Uh, you no, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Because if you uh, have you watched Major Dundee, yeah, have you ever sat through that? 
I uh, can't remember because the uh, extended version came out what like two thousand five. Yeah, something like that. I don't that. think I, I. don't think I have. Well, you know, Dundee. If you watch Dundee, you see it's it's a basically a blueprint, a warm up to what uh, it, it comes I to fruition. I feel like I March. have seen it just because I recognize right. that. Right. Uh, I think I'm talking more of the violence and the milieu of the Southwest and the, and the dry desert, because the Wild Bunch takes place mostly in Mexico and Leone films, uh, uh, because of the Spanish setting in Spain, they had to settle for that the Southwest. They couldn't do uh, like up in the mountains like Anthony Mann films. So, but um, let me backtrack now. So we're you know we, so we go to the Mann films, the Bedecker films, uh, to Peck and Paul. Off a little shoot off, all of a sudden happens with these two movies by Monty Hellman. Mm. Um, and whereas the Bedecker films kind of like r- rub it down to the to the, the raw bone of the Western, uh, the Monty Hellman ones kind of go to a fil- an existential, a- existential version of this. Mm. And they have that, that sense of isolation. There's not people, new people around in these films. You know, they're not, there's not a lot of population going on. Uh, that you see a lot of, you know, other John Ford films or even Anthony Mann films. Right. And uh, so uh, it's, I, I, I think, and I think Monty, I think I saw that he was a big Butterker fan. Uh, really? Uh, yeah. I was, uh, I think I was uh, a picture or something where uh, there was like, um, I think Monty was like uh, buddies with Sam Fuller and Butterker and those guys. And you know, uh, Butterker shows up in uh, the Robert Town film. Yeah, Tequila Sunrise. Tequila right? Sunrise. And Robert he Town. Was, he was going to be, whenever Robert Town, we didn't mention this last week, but when Robert Town was still going to do the two Jakes, he was going to have a big role, Bud Bedecker was. Right. And so uh, I think Body and Robert were close because of, that, Jack, right. because of Jack Nicholson and everything. That whole group and Carol Eastman who did the screenplay for the shooting and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, Buddy, but it's like, a, it's like a little sidetrack where the, uh, the Bedeckers leave off the shooting and ride of the whirlwind. So it's another uh, interesting way to, to uh, perceive these things. Well, you know, one funny thing when I was watching these Criterion um, uh, extras that the thing that always strikes me about two lane blacktop and it's so pretentious to say, but how existential the movie is, right? It's because yes, of its yeah. fairness. And someone asked in this behind the scene, um, I think it was uh, Hellman's daughter asked him like, is anyone happy in the movie? <laughs> And Hellman gives this long explanation where he's like, uh, Camus said whenever uh, Sisyphus came down from the mountain, he was happy. These people are happy in that same way. And then he caught himself. And he's just like, well, I mean, I don't, not to give away the, everyone says this is an existential movie. I'm not trying to use like this seminal work of existentialism, blah, 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 blah. but yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> um, he, his last movie played at South by, I think I was gone that year. We live in 2010. Road but, to Nowhere. Yeah. It was with Shan Shalseman and shot on a 5D. Yeah, uh, uh, I think Video Watchdog did a review of that, and I finally, I, I remember thinking, this is going to be hard to find a while. So I, <laughs> I, I, I bought a DVD, but I haven't watched it sitting right now. I'll probably watch it this week. I'm kind of on a Monty Hellman roll right now. Yeah. And I'm actually going to try to probably get a copy of Silent Night, Deadly Night 3. I heard uh, this, for, you know. I saw this cool story on Facebook of some um, programmer in Austin brought uh, Monty Hellman in, in to watch that. And because I've never seen it, and they were talking about how great and bizarre a movie it is. And Monty Hellman was like, I just made it for the money. I, I, I'll do my intro and I'll come back in and see the audience reaction and maybe, you know, for the QA. And basically, Monty Hellman sat and watched it the entire <laughs> time and kind of enjoyed the audience and joined it and saw it for the first time. He said, I haven't, he said he hadn't seen it since he signed off his friend. Um, some, oh, no, I was going to say the other film we ought to mention is Iguana. Uh, which I I uh, the uh, I, I I have a Blu-ray of that. I haven't watched it yet either. Uh, if you go to uh, Monty Hellman on IMDb, that's his top most known credit. That doesn't make sense. I know because uh, Tulane Blacktop is buried. Uh, in that's that weird, too, right? Uh, the Iguana, and I think it came out originally on disc with a uh, uh, missing scene or something, and then they re-released it with it. The way, but apparently, I read the uh, I, re- I was just kind of spot reading a little bit this week, and it, and it said that uh. He had a really uh, terrible time shoot, uh, on that shoot or something. He didn't have a good time. I don't know anything and, about the movie. I've, and, I've never seen it. Know nothing about it. And uh, but that's the film that Quentin. Uh, you know, you don't know how these things are. How factual that these led to are. Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, right, yeah because that Quentin saw he, he actually he initially wanted Monty to direct Reservoir Dogs, and he's and, and on the basis of the iguana, apparently. 
Uh, it's what I read this one point. Hmm. Uh, and so, and again, um, and there's not that, you know, there's, when it comes down to that, how many films, are, there's not that many films that, that watch of Monty, uh, unfortunately, yeah. sadly, unfortunately, yeah. but we well, can, you can basically get them all, find them all and watch his entire filmography now. And, you know, cause uh, needless to say, he's, uh, passed away now, unfortunately, uh, sadly. Some other, uh, credits that I found, uh, interesting. Oh gosh. Yeah. There's all kinds well, of I mean, like going back to his editing, he did uncredited work on head, the monkeys, yeah, movie, which yeah. makes sense. Cause that is a crazy edited movie um he directed second unit on robocop yeah yeah that blew my mind that blew my mind um the one i wanted to throw past you uh do you remember seeing uh i i I feel like you've mentioned it before um whenever a fistful of dollars aired on network tv in 1977 that was a prologue that's a that's an interesting story. I don't know if I, I, I you may want to cut this out in post. Just, but, just, just, but uh, I'll try to make I'll try to make a brief that I uh, I was of course I I, I worship with the the altar of Leone. So when they were coming out on television, I made a big deal. I actually made flyers and passed it out to my friends and and at the time and, uh, and then their premieres on ABC uh, uh, Sunday night movies and it was a big big deal. And I'm surprised I don't remember being shocked because I knew the films pretty well. But there's this prologue. Fistful Dollars does not start with the prologue. It starts with the credits and goes, and then we see Eastwood uh, riding up into the desolate area. He's the, the the family. Wait, Eastwood's in the prologue? Uh, well, no. There's the, at the time there was never a prologue. That's the you know. The, uh, I'm then, asking, okay about the prologue. So then, sorry, uh, I uh, I would audio tape these things, mm-hmm. you know, and so I had for some reason I know that sequence. I remember that sequence very well. Uh, uh, and why there is a prologue on the TV print at the time was ABC was a little uh, was skittish that uh, of uh, the fact that the main character is out just for money and there's no morals for him. And this is like this is like this uh, when it came on. I can't remember the debut. I'm thinking they're really that it's that's they're really worried about that. So they actually uh, gave they commissioned Monty to shoot a prologue. Of showing the man with no name getting out of jail, and Harry Dean Stanton is the warden, and uh, and if you know Monty Hellman films, uh, Harry Dean almost isn't in all of them. Mm. <laughs> um, Harry Dean uh, basically says, well, "I want you to go into the village and uh, get these two sides warring against each other." So he's he's given a mission to do this as opposed to just he's doing it for the money, and they 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 use a clip of his Eastwood's face, but they shot a double wearing a, a poncho that doesn't match. And they shot like from above over the hat, so you wouldn't see his face. And there's a whole little prologue, and uh, it was hilarious because I remember older gu- film guys here in town were like Ted, you're. F- I-, I was telling them about this. And they go, you're full of it, full of crap. You, that that's not in the film. I go, yeah, I saw it. I remember seeing. It. And sure enough, when the obituary came out for Sergio back to, back when they would do this is before the uh, internet really kicked in, full page obituary on Sergio Leone. They went through everything. They talked about this whole. ABC and the, and the prologue, and I was able to, to show these guys. Yes, see, it does exist. Have you ever looked it up on YouTube? It's on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, it's on the disc now on the Blu-ray. They okay. actually have it isolated for you to watch, um, and it's just it's really crazy. It's really silly, but Bonnie Hellman directed a man a sequence with a man with no name. <laughs> well, okay, uh, there's two interesting. Or, or do you think we're ready to transition on to the? Yeah, I just want to. I, I, speaking of all these credits, let me give a shout out to Brad. Uh, Brad Stevens. He's got a really nice book out on Monty Hellman. Monty Hellman, his life and films. Brad, Brad Stevens, Stevens, not the Boston Celtics coach, right? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> no, Brad Stevens. He writes for Sight and Sound a lot, and uh, uh, it's got a really good uh, exhaustive credits in the back of it, and and uh, it's interesting. Monty did the uh, intro to it. Mm. Uh, he said that they uh, thousands of emails went back and forth uh, as a as uh, Brad wrote this book, so. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he's, uh, it's, uh, if you're for anybody, you you need to get this book. Mm. And, and you, are we ready to transition to Richard now or? (laughs) Sure. Uh, so, uh, uh, with the way there was a shot, um, two lane blacktop was shot in technoscope. Yeah. Um. One of the things Monty Hellman said uh, that that really did was it made your uh, um, lens is wider, so everything was very st- strongly in focus. You, everything was in deep focus, and we're he he ended up talking about the difference between a deep focus movie versus a selective focus movie, which is something <laughs> you shoot long lens. 
And that is one of my two transitions over into talking and into getting straight. The other isn't into getting straight, but just to talking about Richard Rush. The two overlapping things between here is uh, stuntman Gary Kent. I Have you ever seen Freebie and the Bean, Richard Rush's movie? Oh, yeah. I, I, I was there when it came out. That was probably, actually, it's probably the only Richard Rush, well, uh, stuntman, of course, but my first Richard Rush film would have probably been Be- Freebie and the Bean, and it was a big deal. And I, I was a big James Conn fan, and I had a friend that was into uh, car chase scenes, mm-hmm. and so we definitely were there for that. And, I. Uh, I actually uh, have seen both Getting Straight and Freebie and the Bean in 35, Prince. Yeah. And uh, I saw uh, Freebie and the Bean right before Once Upon a Time in Hollywood came out because stuntman Gary Kent, who's in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, introduced both movies. But he also was a frequent worker with Richard Rush. So Getting Straight, Ted, you s- saw for the first time just a few weeks ago, you said. Yeah, yeah. It was one, you know, I, I, there's, a, there's a whole little handful of L.A. Gould movies. I'm familiar with the Gould movies of Altman. But it's interesting. I, I was you, you watch that intro with him and Kim Morgan talking about getting straight. It's like there's like you can you can kind of portion up Gould's career, and there's a, you know the ones that he did with Alwyn. But there's a, he's like uh, getting straight, and there's a couple other ones where he's uh, getting straight's right after Mash though. Yeah, Mash. But there was I'm I'm thinking you no know, in terms of uh, his his patterns, the persona he's playing. Um, I, I can't think of I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the other ones. But you know, uh, but it was really uh, silent partners when you talked about. Well, that's other. a little bit later. That's that's that's, a, that's almost like on the tail end of his uh, active career because he kind of disappeared. Well, you know, one funny thing about uh, um, War Notes in Tooling Laptop to a certain extent reminds me of uh, uh, Gould in Long Goodbye because Long and Gould Goodbye has this very the, the the way that like Gould is constantly just doing this like mumbling narration that is very lyrical to listen to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll have to think about that. No, <laughs> no, you're being very, you're very charitable to me right now. No, well, no, I mean, no, fair enough. I think it, I, as soon as I said it, it's like, cause, cause oh, it's very angry and like, well, he's like, angry and, and he, he is angry, but he's also very lovable in a weird way. He's kind of uh, affable, uh-huh. uh, uh, you know, we're, and, and he's kind of engaged, whereas, you know, Gould and, and Long Goodbye is like, you know, disengaged. <laughs> That's a good so. point. Engaged versus disengaged. That makes sense. Um, so the, the key to re- thing with the transition, um, the most vi- the visually alive thing about this movie, the other thing you brought up when we were talking offline last week about... Rack focus. This movie has some of the most intensive rack focusing oh you were gosh. ever going to see it is, it is so visual in the way it does it, it to the point of distraction oh yeah well it was interesting too because i did i watch yeah i think i watched i think i watched i just recently watched this the the, the making of stuntman the sinister saga which he was richard rush was involved richard, with making a, it and richard that. did he directed it it's a feature-length documentary richard did on his own film i might have seen this i but it would have been years i think ago. it's an, i think if you buy a certain version of the disc that comes with it of the stuntman film. And he talks about how he was, had a whole, he was, had a, a super eight or he had, I don't know what he kind of camera he had. You would, this is more, you're up your uh, alley. Um, uh, and he was, he came up with this rack focus technique and he says, I, it sounds like he was claiming he came up with it and he, he goes, and I wish I had called it the rush uh, focus because then, then there'd be, you know, and uh, in, in other words, it, it wasn't utilized prior to him. You know, I've been thinking about this all week. Since you brought yeah. this up, because I there's no way he created the rack. I was going to say, because I, I, I we, we carnal knowledge has a, a interesting rack in the middle of it, and it was when the lenses got long. It's a technical thing, and whenever technical innovations come on, lenses start getting longer. You get your um, uh, zoom lenses, and then you go longer lenses. It was big in the '60s. You, your idol, well, Richard Lester, was probably a bigger. Well, he might have been. I, I know. I'm not sure. Uh, no one did it this intensive. Right. And I don't know. Uh, he, that's getting straight. He might have, I don't know when he said, he claimed he came up with it, but uh, it might have been even earlier when he did Psych Out or something. I don't know. Uh, but uh, okay. but I'm not sure. But it's it, we, you need to watch that and, see, and, and confirm this for me and see what you think about it. Well, but at the same time, I cannot I could not pinpoint who created the rack focus yeah. or whenever or, or when I, whenever you. I was wondering, I meant to, meant to Google it and see if what. Uh, I thought about it. Yeah. Um, back to what you were saying with L.A. Gould. So L.A. Gould plays a graduate student in here. He's 32 uh, at the time, at the age of this movie. But many people have pointed this out. L.A. Gould in the early 70s is amazing to watch. Kim Morgan in particular seemed to really like him. But, um, but from such a distinctive 
these were your leading men at the time. Like and you, you commented on this in our graduate episode that maybe Dustin Hoffman started the trend of this, but I know the joke I had in the back of my head during some of the sex scenes in here was like leading men needed women who like back hair to play around with the back hair. <laughs> but at this time Gould had done, um, his first big movie was, uh, the night they raided Minsky's, which I, I think is Freakin's first movie. Uh, no, I don't know if it's his first, first or though, but it's early. It's early, yeah. Uh, uh, then his big hit is Bob Carol, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, and then MASH. And then shortly after this movie, back to Jules Pfeiffer, movie I really want to see and I can't find for the life of me, is uh, Little Murders. Uh, I have a Region B copy of it. We can watch it sometime. Okay, I'm down for that. Um, yeah, he's just... it's uh, so. But at the time, Ellie, I remember this, this is... Uh, I mean, I was born in 58, 68, I'm 10 years old, you know, so I, I and I was kind of, you know, looking at all the movie ads and, and there's a lot of movies I didn't see and then movies I wanted to see and uh, other, of course, the things I, you know, it's not the time I didn't have time for or whatever. Uh, but I remember Gould being like, he was like the <sighs> quintessential s- s- representational counterculture star of that time. Uh, in a way, yeah. and and, and uh, especially because of the Altman films, especially, and I, I mean, and I'm thinking, you know, and you know, whereas De Niro and Pacino, uh, they kind of kept, you know, consistent. They kind of kept in the public's eye. Gould just dropped off. I don't know. We we're, we're talking about getting straight. We're, uh, I don't mean to get into Gould's career. No, no. But I remember it was a big deal when it. I remember thinking when uh, War uh, uh, Levinson and. And Beatty used him in Bugsy. Yeah, well, yeah. you you brought this up offline last week, and I was going through his his. Uh, he did so much TV throughout the years, and there's no real reason why he suddenly wasn't in favor after like 1975. Or was there? You know, I mean, yeah, I'm really curious what exactly happened. Well, I, I don't know where ever be privy. You know, was it something you know personal? Was it some industry? Uh, uh, was it uh, uh, his choice, or was you know his his agent? Uh, you know, who knows these things? That why why these things go. Uh, and of course, you know, then you go, you do see, you know, Pacino De Niro eventually start doing a lot of crud. Uh, so. we're, 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 we're branching out. We yeah, should, I know. We, we should focus. Let's, let's bring it back this, in. Bring it back this, in. Because this is the movie. I have gone back and forth on so many times, but like it is dense with stuff to talk about. This movie is is loaded. I mean, it's so it's. Especially now, even. I, oh, yeah. I mean, that's what was so weird. I, I The timing of watching this now. With all the movements going on, uh, right, and, and this is it deals with protests on on the campus. This movie is the, the centerpiece of this movie. So this movie, so this movie is based off a Ken Kolb novel that whenever Rush wanted to make it, it was Rush uh, his first big studio movie, and he wanted to. Uh, he said he just wanted to handle the campus situation. This movie came out the week of Kent State. That, mm. That's what blows my mind. Um, so, the reason to watch this movie now. Even though this movie will have some things that really will throw people off with the modern audience, a lot of stuff in there that will throw people off. Um, I, I think from a political standpoint, like ever since the late '70s, the boomers have the boomers. We've been living the boomers' lives, and there are we've been. Obama pointed this out a few times. We've been going through the same political arguments since the late 60s, early 70s. And this is at the forefront of it when this is the first draft of history. And they're trying to figure out what are we really arguing? What do we really want? And it's amazing to watch this movie that all this shit is still not solved. You still have you still have campus issues right now with you still have like the right to protest or not to protest. You have um, safe spaces in the coddling of the American mind and all these other issues arguing with it. But there's there's just so much passion going behind in this movie that that it's the first draft of history so you got to give them props for maybe occasionally saying some things that maybe my first time watching this movie um uh, it was whenever this new dvd this dvd came out probably 2008 2009 and i had found uh i can't i couldn't find it re- where i heard first saw it it was a tarantino quote that got me into it too he said that it was a movie he watched uh, pre-success in his video watchdog days when, or not video watchdog, <laughs> uh, video archives day yeah. when um, he had a girlfriend who was an English major and he showed it to her and it was a very literate movie for her to watch. And this movie's very, uh, you got to give it credit, this movie's very, very literate, if only uh, I had actually, in, the, in the male Western canon. <laughs> Speaking of closed captions, I put a lot of times I put the closed captions on because I wanted to really I wanted to soak in the the dialogue yeah. properly. Uh, I, I try to avoid putting subtitles or captioning on, but 
you know, of course, it, the, the the temptation is so easy now to do that, especially something with this kind of dialogue and and trying to get across what they're getting across. It helps really. Uh, maybe you know, watch it once with and once without. You know, mm-hmm. right. so this movie with the screen, Rush rewrote a rewrote a treatment of it, and then got someone that had worked with him at AIP, but it was a TV writer, uh, Robert Kaufman, who later uh, wrote Freebie and the Bean, and some of the commentary that both Rush and Elliot Gould have about this guy, they call them a despicable, immoral, prejudiced monster. Yeah, and, and he worked on the screenplay. Yeah, yeah. I guess they thought he was a talented guy who. So how did that work? Gould uh, even called some of the dialogue a little overwritten, um, but they, well, and Rush didn't modify it. They, they went no, with it? Gould called it overwritten now or a few years ago when mm. they, they, this movie reshowed it. The well, yeah, it does. Well, yeah, it is a little in your face. It's a little uh, visually and written. I, I, I uh, but that's that's kind of it's fun. It's kind of fun. In a way, but it's also this is this is the thing that appealed to me in my first viewing. Uh, it, did, it did not. No, did. totally. It I mean, I, I like a yeah, movie. I, mean, I like an overwritten movie occasionally. Yeah, because 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 God knows we've seen a ton of underwritten. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying, it, 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 depending on your mood or how you're going to approach this thing, you're gonna you could you could go one way or the other with it. Right. Uh, but I, uh, but that said, there's so much fun in it. I mean, here and this is here, uh, here's something I'm just throwing in. Uh, this is so trivial. I was shocked to see the uh, appearance of a very fondly loved comic book. Uh, and you did you uh, you probably didn't even know the significance of that comic book he had? I, no, because I, I looked it up. It looked it, you're talking about the Batman comic at the it's end. It's a brave and bold. Oh, is it Neil Adams? It's cover? Neil Adams. Okay, I did catch the Neil Adams part. And it's Batman and Green Arrow. It's the issue where Green Arrow loses his money. And becomes uh, and changes his outfit. Green Arrow does redesign, oh. and, and basically Green Arrow uh, stopped being a Batman clone. And this is the start of uh, the Green Arrow, the radical, liberal, okay. angry man. Green okay. Arrow. Now, w- whether Richard or the anybody knew that, or it was just a, it was just a comic they grabbed, or if, if they if it's very significant in a way because it kind of matches the tone of the whole film. I give you, <laughs> I would give you that. It, not if it was that issue, but if it was the uh, Green Lantern talking to the you you help well, the aliens, a, but you don't help the right. That's the next time we see green arrow a uh that's the follow-up after th- this issue of brave and bone if it was that maybe so. <laughs> uh so igmar bergman called this movie the best movie of the decade uh yeah so i, I best film of the decade bergman <laughs> Wait, what ca- decades because it's 1970 right right and then bergman cast uh gould uh and is it the touch oh yeah yeah uh uh based off this yes yeah gould does a that's again i, I mean I, that's what I was thinking about. How Ghoul was just like the center of the uh, uh, cinematic universe at one time. That Bergman actually tagged him. Of course, he also tagged Devin Carradine for a film too. <laughs> hmm. Well, so uh, Tarantino p- puts us in the sub genre of campus radical movies, right. which include right. um, a movie I just saw for the first time a few months ago, The Strawberry Statement. Right. Which I he's he thought was up there with this. I I just don't didn't remember taking much from it. Well, Quentin does, you know, he finds a lot of interesting little nuggets in films that are kind of people kind of uh, ignore or toss off. I uh, really, the, the biggest thing that really stood out to me about this movie is, um, and you, you, I don't want to like, I want to give it a mulligan on this just because uh, the, the treatment of homosexuality. And because, and I looked it up, homosexuality at this point is still considered a mental disorder. It was not out of the DSM-3 classification until 1973. But at the same time, you look at Tulane Blacktop and how it handles homosexuality, and it's totally, it's just there, it's fine. It's just, but at the same time, it's part of the appeal of this movie because it's bold and in your face verbally. And it's really trying to talk straight about stuff that you wouldn't talk about now. And so it's going to get some stuff that sound well, we should almost th- yeah, 50 we, years after. Yeah, we, we should point out to the, uh, the, if you haven't seen this and you're listening to this now, is that. He he's he's uh he wants to be a teacher in high school, uh, Gould, and he wants he's and he's going in his master's degree. But everybody on campus knows him that he was this formal legendary radical, and they want him and they want to uh, get him to come back and help out with all their movements he was, on campus. He was at Selma, which I also wrote down pointing out. Uh, this movie has Jean Berlin, like uh, what two years a year before Heartbreak Kid, and Jean Berlin's mom is Elaine May, who was I don't know if she was at Selma, but she was in. 
She was in Alabama because it was one of the last uh, main nickels. Yeah, they did. They were they were called down there to help out for the, the right. uh, movement down there. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of great character actors. Jeff Corey and a bunch of people are in this. Harrison film. Ford. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, in fact, I bet there's actually a lot of uh, uh, Star Wars fans that would never watch this film. Watch this because of, they, when you, once you once the cult of Harrison Ford started and Mark Hamill, what do you do? You start tr- searching out all their other films because you become that. Uh, well, there's such a cottage industry of Harrison Ford side parts, so where he shrugs or <laughs> or lifts his eyebrows. Real quickly, back to the campus movies. Have you seen Stanley Kramer's RPM? No, I have okay, not. Okay, I'm really well, curious about this one. I I, uh, I I remember. I mean, again, I remember it when it was out and the you know movie ads and stuff, and I. I it, and I, I'm pretty sure I have not seen it, even though I'm very aware of it, because uh, it was anything. It was a kind of a high profile film uh, at the time when it came out, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't think it did well, and the critics didn't care much for it. The reason I'm back and forth, not completely always in, in on this movie's in this movie's camp was my second viewing. No, my third viewing, my third viewing. Your cinema club thing. I showed this with our past guest host, Lonnie, uh, Lonnie Gonzalez. And I don't want to say she hated it, but she just kept making fun of how much Elliot Gould is yelling. And it's the first time I, I watched the second time I watched it. I watched it on in a print with, I assume there was women there. But this is the first time I watched it with a friend. I just, the Candace Bergen scenes, the way that he's such a jerk to Candace Bergen. And Rush and Gould, in the last interview I read with Kim Morgan, or they, 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 it was on purpose they, 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 they talked about. But there's also a quote from Richard Rush where he says that the Harry, the main character that Ellie Gould plays, is the movie. So. Y- the movie is completely on his back. And so you're in his vantage point. And so when he's mean to Candace Bergen, he's giving these lines about her only being this, like uh, crawling out of the suburbs to get a library car, just to get married. And just, it's just rough because Candace Bergen doesn't have a character in this movie. This character was added. It's not necessarily, the love story is not in the novel supposedly. And it's just rough. But at the same time, like I, 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 Kim Morgan clearly loved it. It's we yeah, love those that aspect of the movie. I mean, because I was gonna say they acknowledge just how mean. Now that you say this, uh, I I can I, I it just hit me that I uh, of all the sequences in the film, the most frustrating the ones the ones I had the problem with are him and Candace in the relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I love uh, the speeches he gives and or and the interaction with the radicals, the interaction with the teachers. But whew, there's that, two scenes in a row that were just rough as shit where it was the one where Candace Bergen, uh, they have a breakup and she, cause I, you know, as much as I love how literary this movie is, this also goes into the, the literary canon. That's a predominantly male literary canon. So she insults him by saying to the point, and it's not, it's not one of those, she knows what she's saying and where the movie is a little knows what it's doing. Says that you, uh, she's like, congratulations, Ernest Hemingway, Philip Roth, Norman Mailer, F. Scott Fitzgerald, <laughs> yeah. making fun of what he wants, the idea, literary ideas of romanticism and shut up woman that he wants to be. And then after they break up, he then goes, he's the whole plot line, one of the big uh, storylines of the movie is he's constantly trying to find a place to sleep and study. That's That's getting through the movie. He goes and has a one night stand with a black woman who. It's just today. It's such a cringeworthy scene where it's just like, uh, "What do you think of James Baldwin?" And can you give me some more writers to think of? Ooh, I need to write this down because I'm a character who's never read a book in her life. Yeah, it's, no, it just comes off so. There, I mean, th- this film is like I said. I think I think depending on the, the day you watch it the, and the way the wind's blowing, you're either going to go, "Ah, oh, this is this is just like uh, a, a hammer pounding on your head." And then another sense, you go, no, this is a lot of fun. There's a lot of cool stuff in it. Well, there's you know? just a lot of uh, opinion in this yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of opinion in this movie. And I don't know if this is one of those things that after the fact, why um, that's why they they really put this on Robert Kaufman. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know, it, it, and it's one of those, and it's frustrating because, you know, it's a whole, you know, a never-ending story about 
protesting and working in the system and it's just the dog eat you know chasing its own tail it's right. like i don't we, we're not getting anywhere we're just constantly the the argument just the the, the argument just continues and continues and continues you know right so, i mean i mean the appeal for me when i first saw this movie was i was an overreading uh post college student but it was also <laughs> poor college student or post college student where the scene where he takes um He's talking to his professor who has his uh, tea wa- a warm tea water. And he's like, hey, are you using that? Puts it in a glass, takes a bunch of ketchup and stirs it up. I think I've done that at some one point. Yeah, yeah. He's To make, uh, to make he, a pour to me in a suit. His car breaking down. My car was breaking down. Car, so bad yeah, time. he has a car that is, just, is in ter- terrible shape. He's behind on his rent. He has no money for food. Uh, and, and, and he plus, yeah, like you said earlier, he's trying to find a place that he can just study. And, and he gets distracted by, you know, this relationship, the the – uh, the the uh, protesters that want him to get involved, uh, the teachers haranguing him. It's just uh, one thing after another. It's a, it's a it's a constant barrage. The film just is it's like a machine gun. It's almost you know it's constantly well, what, shooting what's at so you. funny is Rush whenever he want like the studio wanted Elliot Gould because he was a star at the time and then they asked him and Gould's one uh, worry was like I'm not an angry person. <laughs> I don't know if I you're gonna get me that yeah you know, and like it's Elliot Gould yeah I mean but at the same time Elliot Gould is. He's he is amazing in the movie. I just part of the thing with Candace Berg in this movie, especially watching it two days after watching Cardinal Knowledge, where she's when I saw the second screening of it, uh, the moderators of that screening were really rough on her. They talked about how she couldn't go toe to toe with Elliot Gould. And watching Cardinal Knowledge, I'm not sure that's true because like Mike Nichols gets her toe to toe with Jack Nicholson. Yeah. And better, and in those sequences, she's better than Jack Nicholson. If you're going to make a pissing contest out of it, and I don't know, she just she. <laughs> so, what do you think about Rush? Because uh, uh, I was, you know, I I was talking to Eric Braysmith, the film professor out you know, former side, guest, and we I said something about I had watched the making of this stunt man and talking about that, and uh, and the stunt man and, he, and Eric goes, oh yeah, goes, how does that hold up? And I had I haven't I haven't watched the the film itself, I, but I'd be, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, does Rush hold up? You know, Rush is very, uh, he's to me he strikes me as one of these guys, and I think I have you know what little times I played Mister Filmmaker, is you know I, I'm looking for that shot where you you, you want to get things in the you know you want to get the camera in this right position, and you got things overhanging it or uh, you know on the foreground or because there's a lot of uh, uh, very over. Uh, Choosy shots. I, 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 what you, what's the word Laszlo, Co- Laszlo Kovac shot uh, everything up until Stuntman, I believe. But the one person I like, I don't know exactly how a film set ran in 1970, and my knowledge of it is very based. I'm a post production person, but um, the AC is the person that typically, this isn't cameraman, is the one that runs focus. So I want to shout out to Peter uh, Harrison, is the AC on this movie. <laughs> Because there's there's not a, there's really not a soft shot in the movie, and especially after watching Two Lane Blacktop, where there are a few in there, and or the sh- or the shooting where like there's a lot of because it's a yeah. low budget movie. But do you, do you uh do you do you, uh you know that cool sense of a cool shot? Well, yeah, the sense uh almost he doesn't want to he almost wants to avoid just a strain. Yeah, no, because he said he shot. did. He said he did that just because it's such a verbal dialogue based movie. And yeah. what impresses me every time is the reason you don't do that is because you can't control timing and editing. Mm-hmm. At least that's the reason I wouldn't do that. And like, no, he stages them and he knows exactly what. And yes, it sometimes is back and forth ish and distracting, but like, it's magical at some points. Well, it's, I'm not. I'm not. You talking about the focus? Yeah, yeah. But I'm not even talking about the focus. I'm talking about just just the the layout of the shot. What he has in, you know, the the mm. position of the camera and the and 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 you know, like shooting through a window or shooting, you know, something. Uh, uh, there's a, a stairwell and he has to shoot it. You know, uh, the camera has to be in a certain. And that's, as opposed to just a straight on the two people talking, he I almost wants to avoid that. Like that one shot of uh, Elliot talking between Candace's legs, you know, so obvious. Yeah, you know? that kind of that, to me, yeah. it's almost like he wants to do that for every shot in the film. Yeah, um, there were there uh, were, you know there was a stray shot in the library where he started like. Uh, getting on to some people walking by and it, there was a reason for it like the you know you always talk in directing you need to have something to lead the eye mm-hmm. and he does it every time and in the same time I, I was impressed because i i noticed it and then i was like wow how many as as much as i'm pointing out how distracting it is a lot of times how invisible it had been up until that point because i noticed it 
I, I guess you know that's that's part of this whole machine gun at you and this hammer in the head. It's you know the dial the thoughts the 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 the, uh, the thoughts going on in the dialogue the dialogue itself coming at you in a mile a minute, the framing of the shot and the focusing of the shot. It's just there's constant constant things going on in this film and it's uh, almost somebody you almost want to say hey slow down or you know. Uh, it's it's fascinating, and I, I I'm curious. I'm I haven't seen Psych Out. I need this. I, I, there's some uh, Richard Rush films I need to catch up on, and there's not that many either. Like Bonnie, unfortunately. <laughs> have you? Uh, how much have you seen before this? Because I have seen nothing before this. Well, of of, of Richard, Richard Rush's Rush. before. Well, Freebie and the Bean. You know. No, no, no. I've seen. I've seen. The, there's just the three I've seen. Is this Freebie and the Bean? Bean so, and Stuntman. That's maybe. Have I'm, you seen Color of Night? That's the one I'm curious about. No, it was interesting too because Color of Night was kind of there was this like little controversy with it about the sex scenes or something and it was like you know uncut version of it on laser disc or something i remember you know grabbing it wanting to get a hold of it and i and i don't i guess it didn't play in the theaters i think i would have saw that no i'm pretty sure it played the theaters it played it here, cut. I, I remember when it came out yeah yeah i did maybe i don't know how i missed it or did i miss it or maybe i've totally forgotten it i mean it's, uh, it sounds like something that got cut down but, yeah but no there was there was a yeah there was a big deal about this uncut version with uh, uh especially a uh a, a very uh vivid sex scene or something um, but what was I going to say about Rush? Oh, the focus. Let's go back to that, that focusing where you're talking about. There's, we ought to point out that one scene. There's this one scene where you have basically three people in the frame, to, uh, framed evenly, three faces, and they're all having a, a conversation. Is this the one where Elliot Gould's in the center and he goes you, back and forth right. between? Gould's in the center. And it go, I don't know how long does it go on, about three, four minutes, maybe? Uh, uh, I didn't notice to its credit. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, the only reason I know it, it seemed a little lengthy, no, not in a good, bad way. Right. It was just that I couldn't believe this. The, the rack focusing was going, uh, uh, anytime a person talked, it would focus on that person. So it's going bang, 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 bang. And it's just I'm like, holy crap. There is this, I don't know how well deserved it is amongst camera people, but this idea that when the long lenses are being used, that you know a, a really well composed frame should have everything in focus, but still guide its eyes to, the, to where it's going. But the audience should be able to move its eyes forward. And when you select a focus, you're telling the audience mm. where to look and i don't know if that's there's obviously that's you're dismissing a good 40 percent of film history after 1960 so <laughs> it's bullshit and this was a virtuo, virtuoso performance of the selective focus so yeah. so it's funny to have these two films back and forth with that uh and speaking of just the, uh going back to uh 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 monty helen short uh, briefly uh, the look of Bonnie's films uh, and, and the, the camera choices of framing are just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, very, they match the existentialism of the of feel of the film. The, uh, uh, the pace of a Marty Hellman film, totally different than a Richard Rush pace. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but both just, just striking filmmakers that uh, really deserve their due. And, and, and you just wish that they had, uh, there was more opportunities for them to have make films, you know? Um, I want to celebrate this movie, but I do have a few more. Just it's the finishing up on the Candace Bergen stuff. Sure, and um, and the treatment of homosexuality. The one thing scene that that every viewing since my first viewing has like thrown me off is the big climactic one. Is, is, that, the, is that the? I I wish I could remember before before the climax. Before okay, it's before the climax. The big but, speech, but the it builds big up to, with, the, with the, all the the teachers when he's having his he's final. Doing, his he's or, doing his orals. kind of he's doing his orals. I guess a dissertation, and they start asking him about Gatsby. Is, is that and, the speech that you think Tarantino's referring to when he says the speech? Of the, I mean, because there's several speeches in this film. Hmm. Uh, Maybe I have to go. I want to find that essay. I think it, it might have been a podcast. That Tarantino talked about. This one kind of turned me on because they were really going on and on about the, this the sequence in in, uh, in the yeah. movie, and I'm like, I kind of see this movie now. Well, the basic uh, Gatsby is a, a, going against my whole male Western canon argument from earlier. Gatsby's a, a book I'll, I reread every few years. I love Gatsby. Also, it's a short book; you can read it in a night. And the interp- I, and it's funny because my niece actually had to read it for school, and we were talking about this. The interpretation that uh, Harry gets so offended by of that uh, Gatsby and Carraway are uh, are in love with each other, or, or as he says, uh, what, what Nick Carraway is queer for Gatsby is the phrase he uses. Um, that was what my niece and I talked about. That's a legitimate theory that's very popular right now, or at least in literary circles. And it's it's just a way of reading the book. 
It makes sense. And the fact that it's just like, Gould is so angry and sweaty and the guy kind of has a gay panic. The guy giving him a thing is sweaty too. It's, I don't, I don't know what to make of the scene. It's just like, it, it, it's, I think a key to this movie really is how much, or, or key for me to like the movie or re, re, is how much the movie knows that Harry isn't always right. You know? Cause I mean like he's the one that has a voice in this movie and like he gets pissed off when everyone questions it. My, I also love that point where like um, they're talking money and he turns to Candace Bergen. It's like, Oh, you're going to explain capitalism to me. Like there's just so many, like, or towards the end when she says, I love you. And he never says, I love you back. And, like she's just, 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 it's hard, but this movie is so just opinionated, I guess, is the word I'm thinking of. Yeah. And, and I, I want to say in a good way, and it's a type of opinionate, like people are afraid to do right now and definitely in movies. Oh yeah. I, I like, yeah. in you know, it's that weird regression we've seen from the seventies of like, no one would make this we, before we started, we were talking about directors saying, oh, you can't make this movie today. And we were talking in terms of budget, but this is a movie you couldn't make today. Yeah, you I, think you could? I, I have to think about that. Uh, yeah, because I, I, I always like to poo-poo that. Um, you know, I, I always see you know people you know uh, say, oh, or, or, this is a you know this is a weak year, or this, or this. And I, you know, they're, I think they're I think they're go, they're gauging things by box office and industry things, and and not really. They haven't. They haven't. They're romanticized rose colored glasses. They have deep. The di- you know, they want. They, they want everything to be 1939 every year. You know. Uh. So the the movie opens with um, an apple that's very idyllic apple that it, that says on it, um, "There is no gravity. The Earth sucks." <laughs> And then the movie ends with them handing each other a brick. And I guess a big point of contention for the ending was Rush and Gould wanted Harry to throw the brick through the window and help out with the riots. And my interpretation on this last scene was that somehow the apple just kept going through the movie. Because the, the apples passed from student to student in the opening sequence of the movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, do we, but we don't see the apple at the end, though. You know, the brick looks like an apple. The, so the, the yeah, brick the, is the apple sh- morphed into the brick. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Yeah, is the shape of it. Huh. Um, that's pretty much. That's pretty much all. I mean, I, this. I, 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 I really haven't said enough positive things about this movie. <laughs> no, you did. I think. Yeah, I think. Because, uh, because it really was that uh, I saw it with Lonnie, and she. It, I, I, well, that am, I really, am I that influenceable? Am I? <laughs> Like it, 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 and then this last viewing, I was a little back to like, okay, I'm in, I'm back into this movie. Yeah, it's, it's well, yeah, it, uh, yeah. I think more than importantly than anything else, I, I feel bad about doing an episode moralizing these filmmakers, filmmakers, and now I'm speaking ill of the dead. Huh. It, well, you know, it, it's tricky because, like, you know, Eric asked me if the stuntman holds up, uh, and you know, there could be like uh, the the way a woman is treated in a movie. Uh, I didn't think twice of back in the seventies, and now you watch it now, uh, it's like, oh, that's not going to fly. Rush you very know? distinctly commented that women's lib was really starting to really be pushed at that point when they were making it. And you know, I when you watch these things in isolation, and you're and 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 I think as a movie fan, you you kind of have a different eyes uh, perspective on it. Sometimes I, I'm not I'm not so much a political beast myself. Right, and, and I think I, you are you are more so than well, I. Well, no, no, but I think it's it's a definitely a, a personal journey to be less of a political beast, just because like it, it just seems like a way of being angry and irritable at, at people. Yeah, and and you know you could say well you know c- contextualize it you know when did this come out you know what was the world like because I just watched a a, a Bud Benneker film after we uh, in our last podcast about it. I read Red, Red Ball Express mm-hmm. and I really got a kick out of it. I really enjoyed it, and it also it it, it dealt with. Um, an interesting issue that in the and this is based on a real incident. They the patents uh, tanks were going so far in advance when they got to uh, France, and they after the after the, after the invasion that the tr- uh, they were running out of gas. So they had to create a way to get the gas to them faster. So they came up with this you know quick uh, Red Ball Express highway type thing with trucks, and it was mostly African Americans that drove the trucks. Mm-hmm. 
But in this movie, it's late, it's mid fifties or whatever. It's uh, mostly white guys, but there's some black guys in it. And Sidney Poitier, early uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, and they do address it. Sidney Poitier bit. was in a Bud Bedecker movie. Yes. Wow. And uh, they do address it a little bit, but they don't go as far. In fact, our uh, our guest Robert, Robert, uh, he wasn't he didn't like this film that much, and mm-hmm. I was surprised because I didn't read what he wrote about it until after I watched it. Oh. And I'm like, and then I'm like, oh, and I think he was addressing the racial issue. So yeah. And, and it's like, well, you know, if you look at the when the film was made, I thought it's a. It's a very serviceable, entertaining. And it, it, it goes to the question of do you, you know, there, 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 there's a mulligan you can give a movie just for it trying to be uh, similar to the, the politics of the time versus does a movie have the wisdom to be, because we always grade, also grade movies on, older movies on, did it age well? And that is a part of how a movie ages. Did it have the wisdom to be beyond its time? I don't... Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I just, I, I don't know if it age. I, I just thought it was, it was Jeff Chandler's lead. I mean, it's just a, a small little World War II B film based on a real incident, and it, and it's very, it works, works pretty good, I thought. And uh, then I, when I read Robert wrote about it, oh yeah, well, yeah, they could have really, they, they could have done more with it, but I don't know if the at the time. I thought they were pushing it a little bit anyway. They were trying to address it a little bit, but not. They didn't go as far as they should have. Mm. If they were to be truthful about it, you know. Well, I give the, I give Getting Straight the credit for being a first draft of history type movie, just because like it's it's something that scares a lot of people of like doing hotbed issues, just because you don't want to have the wrong take on something that early. You kind of want a sense of how other people are reacting to it. So yeah. this movie was bold in that regard, and it does get a lot right. I want to say it's it's. It's it's opinionated. I'll, I'll give you that. Um, Ted, do you have anything else? No, just 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 the bottom line. Uh, I think the, I think the main thing that Shane and I want to get across here is that uh, uh, both Bonnie Hellman and Richard Rush uh, both rest in peace. They rest in peace. Very unique, uh, interesting directors. Wish we had seen more out of them. It was an, and a, a very fascinating careers. If you want to dive into them. And I think uh, you'd be well served by checking out all their films. The the recurring thing I, I have on every episode about this is this fan dream of what they could have gotten if they were they were in demand or had money. Oh, and yeah. I mean, just I don't know why either one of these people like uh, Hellman says that uh, he was offered Junior Bonner and didn't take it because he didn't like the script. And then he saw what Peck and Paul did with it. And he's like, oh, I could have changed the script. And <laughs> can you imagine if he would have been hot in the seventies and been making more of his type of movie? He would have totally thrived in the seventies and rush rush was why there's no real good reason why yeah. he wasn't consistently, especially after stunt man. I thought, you know, boy, let's, let this guy do some more films. Like what was air America? He was writing for, he was developing forever and it got taken away uh, and he, he got a screenwriting credit on it. And, that's Hollywood. That's entertainment. Da, da, da. Da, right. da, 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 da. Ted, thanks for coming back. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Go check out some Monty Hellman and Richard Rush films. Yes. Yeah.